Well, good morning. I guess uh, I should acknowledge the elephant in the room and the fact that there are like 20 people in here. And thank you. 20 people who are enthusiastic to be here. But we love all of you who are joining us online. We miss you, and we look forward to the time when we can all gather together again. But we're grateful for the technology that we have that allows us to do this. And if you're joining us online, join the chat, check in, and also give a shout out to the worship team that just came in and did things as normal. There's no social distancing for them on mornings like this. So we're grateful to you guys, and we're, gra we're grateful to you guys for joining us online. So if you have been with us for the past couple of weeks, we've started this new series on um, this concept of identity, this question of who am I, and ultimately looking at who we are in our identity in Christ. And if you are joining us for the first time this morning, whether you stumbled across us online or walked in because you didn't know we had service this morning, um, we're going to recap just so we can catch up to where we are. And we'll take a few minutes to do that. So the first week, we spent talking about how the first step in our identity, in recognizing who our identity is, is that the, it's the fact that our identity is received from beyond us and not created by us. Our identity is not something that we have to look for or achieve. And we spent time in Matthew 3, in particular, looking at the life of Jesus, mostly after his baptism, and how as he came up out of the water, a voice, the heavens opened and a voice came from heaven. It said, this is my son. And that is the identity that Jesus lived in and worked in and, and, and demonstrated power in for the rest of his time on earth. Despite of what people, like in spite of what people thought he should do, in spite of who people thought he should be, he lived in his identity as a son. And our goal for this season is to begin to believe that I am not what I do, I am not what I have, I am not what others say about me, I am a child of God, and my identity comes from above. Last week we learned that the next step to, the, to living out the question of who am I is to see ourselves as God sees us in Jesus. And this is when we jumped into Ephesians chapter 1 and began looking at what the Apostle Paul says is true about who we are. And there was a particular phrase that Paul really loved to use in his writing. And in fact, he uses it 150 times in his 13 letters to the church. And if you remember what that phrase was, it's a simple two words. And it's in Christo, in Christ. And that is saying that what is true about Jesus is now true about you. In Ephesians 1 alone, Paul uses the phrase in Christ to varying degrees 11 times. 11 times in chapter 1 alone. So what does he say? He says, in Christ we have every spiritual blessing. In Christ we have been chosen. In Christ we have been adopted as sons and daughters. In Christ we are blessed. In Christ we have redemption and forgiveness from sins. In Christ all things are being united under him. In Christ we have an inheritance, a future. In Christ we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit who is a guarantee of that future. Our identity is rooted in Christ. And as we walk out our spiritual journey, we're in the process of becoming who we already are in Jesus. The process of seeing ourselves as God sees us in Jesus. Now, I want to encourage you, don't be weighed down by this. Don't let the thought of becoming like Jesus overwhelm or intimidate you. As you think of who you are, versus where you think you should be or who you think you should be, keep this in mind, because this is going to be our focus for this week, that in Christ, I am given power to live in step with my calling. Paul spends 11 verses in Ephesians chapter 1 proclaiming deep and profound truths, that of our true inheritance in Christ. He introduces a major theme that he's going to spend the rest of the book expounding on. But before he explains that, before he goes any further in chapter 1, he jumps into this really beautiful prayer that's in verses 15 through 23. And we're going to look at that now. If you are joining us online, there is a section for you to see the scripture, or you can just listen. That's fine too. But this is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. 
And he says, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. And now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Amen. There's so much here. And I would encourage you to go back and reread chapter 1 over and over and over again. But since we don't have time to do that this morning, we're just going to stick to looking at these few verses together. So again, Paul has introduced this huge theological truth about our identity, that it is found in Christ. That what is true about Jesus is now true about us. But here, in verses 17 through 23 in particular, he prays three specific things over the church. Number one, that they would receive spiritual wisdom and insight. Number two, that their hearts would be flooded with light in order to understand. Number three, that they would understand the incredible greatness of God's power for all who believe. He's not simply praying these things because he thinks they're nice things to say. He's praying these things because he wants specific things for them as believers, who, who know that their identity is rooted in Jesus. So let's unpack these a little, looking at the first two together. So the first thing he prays is that they will receive spiritual, wi- spiritual wisdom and insight because spiritual wisdom and insight lead to growth. Paul prays that they will receive spiritual wisdom and insight in order to grow in their knowledge of God. Wisdom begins with the Spirit illuminating our hearts so that we can understand what redemption is, the truth of the cross, and Jesus reconciling the world to himself. That doesn't come from us. That comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit who enables us to understand and the Spirit who continues to give wisdom and insight so that we can understand more and more outside of the confines of human wisdom and grow in our knowledge of God, who he is, what he's doing, and how it includes us. So let's jump right into the next one. He also prays that their hearts are flooded with light. Because hearts flooded with light lead to confident hope. As Paul continues this prayer, he prays that their hearts are flooded with light so that they can understand the confident hope that God has given to them. The word here for heart is referring to the inner life. Paul is asking that the inner life of the believer, the the mind, the thoughts, the will, that all of it would be illuminated and enlightened by the power of the Spirit in order that we who are believers may understand the hope that we have. And what is that? What is that hope that we're talking about? That we understand the hope of our future. That is to say, he is praying that literally everything about who we are our thoughts, our mind, our will, will come under, under, in line with the hope that is in Christ Jesus because we recognize that what is true about him is now true about us, and we want to live like that as believers. My biggest concern, actually, in all of this talk about identity is the fact that when we, even though we're hearing that what is true about Jesus is now true about us, that we, won't, that we won't believe it. That we'll look at it as something that's nice. Oh, that's nice for someone else. It might be true for someone else. It might have been true for the people in Ephesus, but I don't think that's true about me. My life is too complicated. The world is different now. It's not just that easy to define. And I want to say to that, like, nice try, but no. 
There's nothing new under the sun. The church in Ephesus did not have an easier time. Your neighbor is not having an easier life. Church leadership is not leading an easier, more spiritual life. Life is hard. It always has been. But here is what is true. What is true about Jesus is now true about you. Life may feel very far removed from the church in Ephesus, but at its heart, that was this, the, a city in the middle of an extensive empire that was always in some kind of upheaval, that was always experiencing some kind of change in leadership, and with that, change in ideals, that was experiencing leaders who were capricious and sometimes vindictive. And, and, and there was this underlying tension of fear throughout the empire. That's not that different from where we, from where we are now. There was uncertainty there was fear, and I don't know about you, but that feels a little bit like what we're living through right now. It feels a little bit like our current climate. When we're faced with the reality of a pandemic that hasn't really been a reality for us, I don't remember living through any kind of pandemic. Or before the pandemic even got started, the reality of facing another election year, another time of possible change in leadership and ideals and this tension of fear that runs through our country. What I would really love for myself right about now and for us as a church is that we would be people who would cling to and ask for the wisdom and insight that comes from the Lord alone. There is enough fear in the world. There is enough changing information. There is enough false information that only leads to more uncertainty. And the antidote to that is wisdom and insight that comes from above. My prayer over the last couple of weeks, and particularly this last week, in particular, like just this last week, Lord, give us wisdom, your wisdom, not someone else's wisdom, not the internet's wisdom, your wisdom. Help us live in line with, live in line with that, that my mind and my heart and my thoughts and my will would be lined up with you and what you are saying and what you are doing and not what anyone else is saying or doing. That's Paul's prayer right here in Ephesians chapter 1, that in spite of what is occurring in the world around us, that we're influenced by an eternal identity and a perspective that comes from Jesus. But not just that, because he's not done. We're not done. That's not, where he ends the, he, that's not where he ends the prayer. His next thing is that we would realize that we have the power to walk out that identity in Christ. It's just glancing back at verses 19 and 20. He prays that we will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believed in him, the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. So here's what he's saying there. In Christ, I am given power to live in step with my calling. It's not just wisdom and understanding that are available to us. It's power for living as well. This letter was written during a time when people loved the idea of controlling and manipulating the spiritual world around them. We live in a world where people love manipulating and controlling the world around them. But for Paul, and for all of us really who are believers, the greatest ever display of power was that moment on Easter when Jesus was raised from the dead. Not only was he raised from the dead, he was put into a position of power where he is sitting at the right hand of the Father for all of eternity, reigning over the cosmos, forever, in perpetuity. There is nothing greater than him. There is nothing that will ever beat him. There is nothing that will ever surpass his power. Jesus is far above any ruler, any authority, any power, any leader that ever was, is, or will be, both in this world and in the world to come. All things are under his authority. He is head over all things, and pay attention to this. It's for the benefit of the church. The church in Ephesus would have been well acquainted with exorcists and magicians who would try to manipulate powerful spirits by invoking their name. But what Paul is saying here, and praying over all believers, is that we would recognize that Jesus is higher than all spirit powers. He is the highest authority. He cannot be exploited. He cannot be defeated. So what are we saying? What is true about Jesus 
is now true about us. Paul is saying that those united with Christ have been raised above these powers. So this means that we are no longer subject to the authority of what I do, the authority of what I have, the authority of what others say about me, the authority of where I come from, the authority of what has been done to me, the authority of what others have, what I have done to others, the authority of cultural ties, whatever authority dominates your life no longer dominates your life because of who you are in Jesus. Jesus has all authority. Jesus has the final say. So what does Jesus say? He says, you have life in me. You have a name in me. You have a place in me. You have a future in me. You have a family in me. You are not alone in me. You have power to live in me. He is head over all things for your benefit. So when Paul prays in verse 19 that they understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those that believe, he is saying, he is praying that they understand, now listen here, that they understand, that you understand that the same power that caused Jesus to look at death, death, the only guarantee for all of us, caused Jesus to look at death and say, I'm done with this. I'm I'm over this. It's the same power that is with you and in you and gives you power for living. In Christ, I am given power to live in step with my calling, my identity in Christ, becoming who I already am. I am given power to do that. Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, and ultimately for us as well, is that we would come to, re- to realize that same power that caused Jesus to look at death and say, not today. It's the same power that is available to us for our daily use. That our understanding of the work that God has already begun in our lives would increase and that we would recognize our inheritance and live in light of that power. So what does this mean? It means that we have power for living. It's as easy as that. Now, when we talk about power, this kind of power, it's not just limited to mighty and miraculous works of the Holy Spirit. Though those things do happen, and we need those things to happen. But sometimes the power of the Spirit just looks like having the strength to make it through the day, to take one more step, to hold on just a little bit longer to that hope to not let hope be totally extinguished at all. Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus from prison. And I don't know about you, but I I don't think Roman prisons were all that fun. But yet Paul is praying this mighty prayer over them, and he is filled with this power because he understands it is available to him. He has it, and he is praying the same thing over them. So what does that look like in our lives? Real talk? Uh, for me, what this looks like in my life right now is uh, in dating. And I'm not, I'm not even kidding. And uh, it sounds a little bit funny, but I decided to jump back into the world of online dating in January. And holy buckets. <laughs> holy buckets. If you think for one second that you don't need the power that raised Christ from the dead with you and in you when it comes to dating, then y'all have been out of the game too long. Congratulations. But like, it's like the Wild West out here in in these streets. It's insane. I spend so much time thinking, is this really happening? But it's, it's crazy. And it's discouraging and demoralizing. And sometimes it can dis- extinguish hope and play into your deepest securities. And I have found that if I am not careful, if I am not rooted in my identity in Christ or relying on his power in my life, that I can spiral out of control really quickly. That I give in to despair or become totally ineffective in all areas of my life. And it seems like such a dumb and simple strategy to use against me, but I'm embarrassed to admit that it's been very effective. So last Saturday, I was actually on a plane getting ready to leave the Phoenix airport, and I was overcome with this incredible sadness. 
pining, really, over something that I thought was going somewhere, and it ended up going nowhere, and I was just, like, lingering so close to despair. So I started praying, but it sounded more like, what is wrong with me? And the Lord in his goodness came back with, what, why do you think there's something wrong with you? And I was just like, because this never works out, because I'm sitting on a plane, totally bummed out by this guy that I barely know, and my last date was so bad, it was like an out-of-body experience. <laughs> Y'all are laughing because you've heard about it. <laughs> and the Lord said, do you think that it's possible that all of the dumb things that have been said to you or done to you or your perceived rejections could actually be used against you as a tactic from the enemy. And then I was mad because, yes, that was exactly what was happening. The nature of dating is that it works out or it doesn't. Sometimes it stings a little, but you move on. But what was happening to me is that everything that didn't work out was stockpiling and becoming a lens through which I started to view myself and found my worth and value was lacking. My identity was starting to be based on what others thought about me. Listen to me. You have an enemy who knows your weak spots. He knows where to get you. He knows where it's going to be most effective. And he's going to work against you to keep you lost and ineffective your whole life. I have to engage the Lord in this part of my life because I won't make it without him. It will destroy me. But with him and his power present in my life, I can navigate this process and learn from it. Already, it has taught me so much about myself. I'm not great at vulnerability, but I'm practicing it, and I'm becoming better and better. It's a process, and it takes the Lord. I am overwhelmed overwhelmed by the thought of allowing someone else into the narrative of my life, and I throw up really good defense mechanisms. But with the Lord, present and involved, he begins to, to reveal things and say, you know what, we can knock down that wall. It's okay to let people in. It's okay to give them access to this part of your story, and it's a process but I'm learning bit by bit how to let that happen. It's his power present for everyday living. So what is the space in your life in which you need to see his power present and available to you? Maybe it's work or your marriage or parenting or maybe you've gone through or are going through a really terrible divorce or maybe you're starting over, or maybe your finances have been wrecked, or maybe you just need to start each day with the belief that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is now available to you and for you to use. Whatever it is, however mundane or regular or silly it may seem, it's there for you. Ask for it. Just ask. What is true about Jesus is now true about you. And he alone can give us power to walk that truth out. And Paul's prayer for us here in this space in Ephesians chapter 1 is that we would get it. Worship team, you guys can go ahead and come back up. As we close, I want to challenge you with a couple of things. And online on the note sheet, um, or even if you're watching on your phone, there's a space for a note sheet. It has two challenges for the week. The first challenge, as you go through the week, I would encourage you to begin to think about the space in your life where you need to see God's power at work. Maybe it's some of the things that we listed before, a marriage, children, whatever it is. Maybe it's something that no one else knows about. Whatever that space is, I would encourage you to begin to ask the Lord to show it to you and then let his power be manifest in it. Ask, because he wants to give us good things. He wants to give us power for living because he already sees us as who we are in Christ, and he can give us the power to walk that out. The second challenge 
uh, is really more of a charge, and it comes from the end of Ephesians, and we're actually not going to make it there in this series, so I don't feel like I'm giving away any spoilers. But this is Ephesians chapter 6, and we're not going to read the whole thing. We don't have time to read the whole thing. It's chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, and we are going to read verses 10 through 13 together. Uh, Because Paul, at the end of Ephesians, gives them this charge, beginning in verse 10. He says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world and against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. We have an enemy who does not want you to know your identity in Christ. And he would love nothing more than to see you lost, confused, apathetic, and totally ineffective. He knows your weak spots, and he will work against you your whole life seeking to destroy you. But remember that we have power in Christ. This power gives us the ability to be strong in the Lord, resist the enemy, and stand firm in the time of hardship. The Lord has not left us alone. We're not alone. He does not give us an impossible task. Often when we talk about the armor of God, I think we think of it as our own armor. i got to put on my belt of truth today. That's not what it is. It's his armor. It originates from him. It is power for living, living given by him. So what is it that we're supposed to arm ourselves with? Truth and God's righteousness. What is true about Jesus is now true about you. Peace. That comes with the message of the good news. Faith that keeps us from giving in to despair or discouragement. Salvation, an identity that cannot be taken from you. And the word of God that is filled with truth. In Christ, we have power to live in step with our calling. But it's a process. And it takes intention. We don't just accidentally live in power. We choose it every day, every moment sometimes. Don't give in to the tyranny of false identity. Don't lose yourself to the schemes of the enemy who just wants to take you out of the game. What is true about Jesus is now true about you. And he gives you the power to live in step with that truth. So what Paul is praying here, what all of us really are, should be praying here, is that we live in light of that, that we get it, that it's there available to us, and we live like it. So whether you are in your home or in this room or anywhere else listening to this message, I would encourage you that you close your eyes, even if it's embarrassing. Maybe people think you're meditating if you're in a Starbucks. I don't know. Who cares what happens in a Starbucks? Close your eyes, because I'm going to pray this over you right now. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate our hearts with wisdom and understanding, that we would grow in knowledge of God, that we would grow in the knowledge of his power, that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that we would be aware that that's, it's available to us. Not only that, but that we would ask for it. That we would say, Lord, let that power be present in my life right now. Whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, you reign above it all. Everything is subject to you, and you are reconciling all things under you. Lord, let that be true in our own understanding of who you are and who we are because of you. 
We thank you for the opportunity that we have to hear this word, even if we can't be together while we hear it. We thank you for the technology that makes it possible and that your spirit is present everywhere. It's the same everywhere. We thank you. We love you. We're grateful to you. Illuminate our hearts with this truth. Amen.